Ok, <rire> je m'excuse. Ok, euh, merci beaucoup, Rocher. C'est un grand, grand honneur d'être invité au Collège de France, euh, de présenter. C'est un grand défi aussi. Euh, et c'est un défi, un challenge, which I am going to fail, I'm afraid. I'm going to present in English with, with apologies. I, I hope this is anticipated, if anyone is, is not expecting me to present in English. Uh, Uh, it would be much worse for you if I presented in French. <laughs> okay, uh, so it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm going to touch on some of the issues which, which Roger mentioned, and I'll try and draw links between my presentation and, and his. Um, but I'm going to uh, really talk about a different set of issues, uh, related, of course, but focusing very much on recent research and on... Um, Uh, both theoretical and empirical, and I'll talk a little bit first about the empirical evidence, which has been uh, hitting trade and economists in general like an avalanche. We live in a world of data. There is so much data on my iPhone, on your uh, uh, mobile, so much that, is all, that always was there, but was buried in the vaults of central banks inaccessible uh, unless you uh, actually visited the banks. Now you can get it on, on, on a CD, you can get it on a memory stick. And what have we learned from all this about, uh, about trade? What we've learned, first of all, is how important firms are. Traditional trade theory doesn't mention firms at all. Uh, the first wave of micro data from about mid-90s mid onwards, uh, more and more economists had access to large data sets and found things that were really very different from what we had thought. Exporting firms turn out to be rare. Most firms don't export. Okay? Many firms, indeed most firms, in exporting sectors don't export. Okay? Exporting is a rare thing, and it's done typically by firms that are larger and more productive. Well, that's one set of information. A separate series of data, which came out in, uh, more in the sort of 2000s uh, onwards, is looking inside exporters, what can we say, looking inside firms. It turns out that uh, even within the range of firms that do export, so we take all the firms, we throw away the firms that don't export, the very small ones, and the medium-sized ones, and some large ones perhaps, and we're left with only the exporters, And even these exporters, it turns out, uh, differ. There are basically two groups. And the ones that matter are very different. They're larger, they're multi-product, they're multi-destination. If I may be forgiven, I'll show you French data in a moment. Here's some American data. And let me focus on the, the numbers that matter. The data here are broken down by the number of products that a firm exports. These are all American firms in uh, the year 2000, all, expo all exporting firms. The number of products and the number of destinations, destination countries. And we see that, what, one ha a quarter or so uh, export more than five products. But that quarter accounts for 98% of the value of exports. 2% only is what's left. Well, you could forget about the 2%. If you could explain this quarter of firms, you would basically be explaining the whole of export behavior. Now, I'm not saying the other firms are uninteresting. Uh, it is notable that the, these large exporters account for only 83% of employment. So clearly, if you care, and we all care about employment, it matters to look at the other firms as well. Okay? But this becomes the, 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 the sort of di dichotomy, the bimodality. There are two modes here. And uh, this becomes even more extreme when we look at firms that export at least five products to at least five destinations. Now we have only 11.9, 12% of firms, uh, 12% of firms, but they're accounting for still over 90% of export value. Much less of employment, so again, it, it, it matters for employment, but in terms of export value, these are the big ones. By contrast, at the other end, we have 40% of firms, these are the large firms, we've thrown away the small firms, we're looking only at exporters, and 40% of these relatively large firms are in fact minuscule. They are tiny. They account for 0.2% of export value, although they do account for 7% of employment, suggesting in a very crude way that they're much less productive than the other firms. The information there from US data, I've summarized here from the work of uh, Thierry Mayer and Gianmarco Ottaviano, uh, information for around the same time in uh, French data. The picture is somewhat different, but qualitatively it's exactly the same. Okay, so firms that export only one product to one market, 30% versus 
0.7% versus 0.2. Given the imperfections in most data that we use, we could forget about these firms and we would have not lost much in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of explaining export behaviour. The firms that export five products at least, to five markets at least, account for 90% uh, of American exports, 873 of French. So the same story roughly. And this picture turns out to be repeated when we look at firms in other dimensions. Uh, if we look at growth, for example, it turns out large firms grow just as quickly as small ones. There is a view that small firms grow faster. It turns out a very interesting new paper from the Banque de France by um, Berthou and, and, and Vicar shows that that suffers from a statistical illusion. If all firms were born on the 1st of January, okay, then it would be fair to compare the growth rate of small firms in their first year with the growth rate of big firms in their small, in their fir in, in, in uh, the, the growth rate, rate, rates of established large firms. But most firms aren't born on the 1st of January. On average, firms are born on the 1st of July in a year. If you look at annual data, firms born on the 1st of July in their first year don't do very much. In their second year, they do a lot more, and they will seem to have very high growth rates. And it turns out when you correct properly for this and use wonderful French data, which are broken down by month of, of exporting, it turns out that small firms actually don't grow any faster than large firms. So small firms grow at the same rate and they're much less important in total. They also are, uh, sorry, I'm talking about, uh, uh, sorry, large firms. Large firms are older. That's an important issue if you look at uh, lists of great firms, if you look at the CAC 40, if you look at the Fortune 500 today versus 20 years ago, the, the world has changed, the world economy has changed. We do see new firms, we do see new industries, we see new countries, um, but in fact we see the same old firms in existing markets. Uh, and um, th th there is a persistence at the very top of many industries, which is remarkable and very different from the view taken in standard theories of international trade, which I'll come to. Okay? Finally, large firms are the ones who do most R&D. So that's not all I will say about facts, but I'm going to be mostly asking how does this relate to current theories of international trade? And here, uh, uh, Roger Guinery has already introduced, uh, mentioned Krugman and certainly Mellitz, Mark Mellitz, um, who uh, has pushed forward, a, a, a d d d d d I guess these two names are associated with, many other people have contributed, but these two in particular are associated with uh, the modern theory of international trade insofar as it focuses on firms and builds on and extends the Ricardian and Hectorolean traditions we saw already. What do, can we say about these, uh, these models? Well, I'm going to argue, first of all, Criticism within the theory. Taking the theory on its own terms, they make very strong assumptions about functional form. And I think we're only beginning to understand uh, the implications of these assumptions. And I'm going to talk a bit about some of my own recent research, and this will be the most technical part of my presentation, which looks at the implications of functional form and shows that the assumptions made in these models are very special. And then I'm going to point out that uh, these papers assume that firms interact in a particular way. The market structure is what's called monopolistic competition. I'll talk a little bit about that and about its limitations. Um, it's embedded in general equilibrium. That's a good thing. But I'll come back and explain why it's good and why we would want something else. It also assumes that firms enter and exit rather rapidly. And I'll come back to, you remember I said a moment ago, large firms tend to persist. Okay? What are the big French car makers today? Renault. Renault was a big car, ma car maker many, many years ago. What's the biggest French exporter in, 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 in any different industry? In, in, in industries that existed 40 years ago, it's typically the same firms that are at the top, with exceptions, of course. Finally, I would argue that the uh, mainstream models don't allow for what I'll call superstar firms, the firms that we saw in those, uh, those crude numbers, the ones at the very top doing lots and lots of things, exporting lots of products to lots of destinations, whereas most firms are smaller and engaged in far fewer activities. Okay. So I'm going to hopefully talk a bit about, uh, about a number of these issues. I'll talk, as I say, about functional form, which is saying, let us take the standard theory as it's on, on face value. Let's accept monopolistic competition, free entry, and so on. And let's ask, is even that theory biased against large firms? And I'm going to suggest it is. 
And then, much less technically, I want to give an overview of some work by myself and many others, uh, which looks at uh, alternatives to the current theory and uh, suggests directions in which we might go from here. So let me start off, as I say, with the, more, the most technical uh, part of, the, uh, of, of my presentation. But I'm going to be presenting it in a way which essentially relies on diagrams. So I'm going to use the, build on the long tradition of international trade theory, where many important points can be made, can, can be made visually. Initially, though, how do we specify demands in monopolistic competition? Well, remember, monopolistic competition is where firms produce different goods, but they're all small. So that, that, that's the essential thing we want to model. Now, all of this goes back in principle to Chamberlain, who invented monopolistic competition in the 1930s. And in principle, there are no restrictions required on demand functions. Demand functions could be complicated in all sorts of various ways. And if you look at Chamberlain's book, 1933, and many subsequent writings, uh, demand curves and the marginal revenue curves, which drive firm behavior, these are monopolists, remember, uh, those curves can be of very general shapes. The problem is that it's hard in that context to get results, and in particular, it's hard to extend this model to general equilibrium. Okay? Firms are taking not the price as given. The firms in competitive models take the price as given. They're very small. These firms are still small, but they produce something that's distinct. It has a brand, if you like, and they take the demand function as given. But if those demand functions have complicated shapes, it's hard to say, uh, it, 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 it's, it's, very, it's very hard to solve things. So this, although it may look a bit daunting, is actually quite simple, at least relative to what Chamberlain did. This is the breakthrough that came in uh, 1977 with a famous paper by Dixit and Stiglitz, a very much cited paper, uh, which proposed um, a particular tractable form, the constant elasticity of substitution form. This actually goes back to work by uh, the English mathematician uh, uh, Hardy. Hardy was famous for saying that good mathematics should be useless. And uh, I won't say whether this is useful or useless, but it, uh, it ironically builds on Hardy's, uh, Hardy's insights. And what's the story here? Forget the details. The bottom line is that a consumer, an aggregate consumer, derives utility from consuming lots of different goods. Think of X as the level of each good consumed. Okay? And that utility takes, has two dimensions. First of all, it's um, uh, essentially an a sum, an integral, an integral of the utility derived from each individual good. So you consume lots and lots of goods, and the more of each good you consume, the better off you are. Okay? How much better off? Well, that depends. It dep it's curved. You don't want to be uh, increasing your, your marginal utility because that wouldn't make sense for a monopoly firm. You want, to be, you want this curve to be concave, the individual ut utility function for a single good. But it's not just concave. Dixit and Stiglitz modeled it in this particular uh, strongly specified way. It's come to be called the CES, or constant elasticity of substitution form. And essentially, when you solve the model, this is what you get for a demand function. Now, think of real demands, the demand for any good that you consume. What determines your demand? Even economists are willing to admit that the demand for any good depends on a million things. It depends on the price, of course. Well, that is there. The price of good eye determines the demand for good eye. But it also depends on the prices of all the other goods. It depends on your income. And it depends perhaps on, on uh, marketing and tastes and so on, which we will hold constant. But let's think about income and prices of other goods. Why aren't they in there? Well, actually, they are. But they're summarized by this little parameter, which has the, the title, which we call the Lagrange multiplier. We're not far from the Rue Lagrange here. And uh, that Lagrange multiplier arises from the maximization of this utility function subject to the consumer's budget constraint. Now, what's nice about this framework is that lambda, the Lagrange multiplier, because, of, because this utility function takes the form of a sum or an integral, because it's additively separable in the jargon, the demand for each good depends on things outside its own market only through lambda. We can say that lambda is a sufficient statistic for the rest of the economy. Okay? The demand for this good depends on what's happening in this market, which is basically the price, and on everything else, and everything else is summarized by lambda. Okay? So 
we have partial and general equilibrium linked in a very clean way by lambda. Okay? If you like, the firm takes lambda as given. The firm takes the demand function as given. This was Chamberlain's insight. There's a perceived demand function, which the firm takes as given. And then the rest of the economy, we economists and viewers of, of the economy, understand that lots of things are happening, and those things are changing, and will change lambda as a result. That role of lambda, which I'll come back to, uh, is true of any form that is additively separable in this way. The particular form which Dixit and Stiglitz introduced, though, turns out to be extremely easy to work with theoretically, especially if we assume that goods are symmetric, which is often done. And it's extremely easy to work with empirically. These demand functions, the, that theta there is a constant, so they have a constant elasticity. So if you take logs, they're linear. Well, anyone can, uh, these days, uh, can go to a computer and program a log linear demand function. If you also have iceberg transport costs, which Roger Genry mentioned, then you have log linear uh, transport costs. So you end up with a function which depends in a nice linear way on the log of transport costs and on the log of price. Very easy to estimate, very simple and easy to extend both theoretically and empirically. But unfortunately, very special. And what I want to do in the next five minutes is to give you a picture, a way of looking at demands, which suggests just how special it is and which also suggests how much this matters. So what I'm going to do is take a firm's eye view of demand. Let's back off from all that integral stuff, all the other goods. Let's just think about it if we're a firm. What does a firm care about? Well, first of all, it takes the demand function as given. Let's write it in this way. In the previous slide, I wrote it including lambda, because as economists, we worry about the economy-wide le economy level, what's all the other things that affect demand. But let's forget about that now. Let's think of the firm as considering on, only its own price. So it could be demand as a function of price. It's actually simpler to write price as a function of demand, but nothing hinges on that. It turns out the firm locally cares about only two things. It cares about the slope of this demand function. As always, we don't want to measure the slope in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of euro or dollars. They would be different, for example. We want to measure it in unit-free indexes. So we measure it in terms of the elasticity, which is, uh, uh, which is given by that. It also depends, as we'll see, on the curvature, not just how the slope, but the second derivative of the, uh, I'm using primes here for derivatives, the second derivative of the curvature or convexity of the uh, demand function. And I'm going to measure this again in a unit-free way. We don't want this to be sensitive to dollars or pounds or, or euro. So measure it, call it using it rho. And I'm going to illustrate everything in the next five minutes in the space of epsilon, the elasticity, and rho. And what do we know about this space? So far, nothing. Oh, by the way, zero row, that would be a line that didn't have any, that had zero curvature. So it had a constant slope and no curvature. So it's a straight line. That's a linear demand function. So that's one useful reference point. But we'll want some others. Okay, uh, I'll skip alternative measures. Now, what can we say, first of all? That space I showed you, is any point equally likely? And the answer is no, definitely, because from the firm's perspective, the firm cares about two things. It, it cares about, if you like, equating its marginal revenue to its marginal cost. Okay? If it were not having marginal revenue equal to marginal cost, it wouldn't be maximizing profits. Okay? So marginal revenue had better be equal to marginal cost. When we transform that we, in terms of the notation I introduced, then if cost can fall as low as zero, it turns out that elasticity had better not fall below one. Well, that's a standard result. The elasticity of demand facing a monopolist cannot fall below one. There is also a second order condition, of course. If you maximize a variable, a function, you better get a point that is stationary, but stationary where the uh, uh, function is decreasing rather than increasing. The second order condition had better be met. That imposes a restriction on curvature, which in terms of the index I introduced can be written as rho must be less than two. So straight away, we have a, an admissible region. Out here, it's not that consumers will never choose to be out there, but monopoly firms will never choose to serve consumers on the segments of the demand functions represented by these regions. So we have a region which extends, by the way, to infinity in both directions here, although the interesting parts of it are going to be this area here. Well, I said, um, and, and 
oligopoly raises different questions, but anyway. So, so let's stick with monopolistic competition, monopoly firms. We want one other reference point, because I've mentioned the CES case. Where does that fit in here? Okay. Well, in, a way to think about it is that the elasticity of demand, in general, varies with the level of sales. Okay. But of course, there is one special case. CES is constant elasticity of substitution, but in fact, it's also constant elasticity of demand. Okay? It turns out it's not just constant elasticity of demand, it's also constant curvature of demand measured in, our, in the way we're doing it. So we can take, there's a single parameter, this is the demand function I gave you a minute ago, rewritten slightly just to get rid of the, the lambda stuff. And it turns out the elasticity is fixed, the curvature is fixed, closely related to it, and we have a relationship between these two, which looks like this. Okay? Indeed, there's one familiar landmark, which Roger Guenery already mentioned, the Cobb-Douglas case is very special. That's where the elasticity of demand is one, the convexity is two, and uh, that's just on the boundary of both the first and second order conditions. Every point along here represents a particular constant elasticity of substitution demand function. Now let me move on. The CES is not just interesting in itself, it's a very important boundary. Okay? A boundary between what in earlier work I've caught with the co-author I've called super and sub-convexity. And basically we can think of it as follows. We're in the admissible region, okay? so we're going to be to the, in, in this rectangular area here. Are we going to be more convex or less convex than the, uh, than the CES case? Well, it depends. It depends on what we assume about demands. It turns out it really matters, not just for, for decor, for, the, for looking at the diagram, but it matters for the prediction that we make about how firms will differ in size or how they will behave in different markets. Because whether the demand function is super or sub-convex, in the sense that I gave, the, gave you now, determines, is equivalent to whether or not its, um, its elasticity is increasing or decreasing in sales. I won't bother with the, the, um, uh, the algebra. But just notice that uh, we have two regions here, and these arrows now can be thought of essentially, uh, sorry, uh, let, let me hold that. Uh, these arrows reflect what's happening as, as sales increase. It could be two different firms, one larger than the other, or it could be the same firm selling in two identical markets, except that one otherwise identical market is larger than the other. So elasticity is going to fall and Margins are going to increase as we move down in this part of the curve and as we move up in this part. Which is most plausible? It matters, for reasons I'll, we'll see in a moment. Well, we have a lot of, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, precedents to go with here. Marshall famously said he devoted a whole chapter of his Principles of Economics in, in 1920, written over many years, published, typically dated 1920, but started in 1890, uh, he argued that this case, what I'll call the sub-convex case, is the most plausible. Okay? Uh, Krugman, in a famous paper in 1979, said it was obvious that it had to be there because it gave silly results otherwise. In the rest of his career, he assumed not that we were in this region, but on the boundary, on the CES boundary. But it turns out lots of demand functions uh, I must, as being Irish, I must mention the stone Geary. Geary was Irish, uh, the linear expenditure system. But the linear demand system, which we've seen already, the straight line demand function is inside the subconvex region, constant absolute risk aversion demand functions, and many others that are widely used by econometricians other than trade theorists are in this region. Okay? Um, Notice one other thing, that these arrows, it's, it's like a phase diagram. It's like a diagram that you would use to describe behavior over time, except we're not looking here at behavior differing across time, but across uh, a cross-section, a, a single firm behaving in different markets or um, different firms in the same market or whatever. Okay? Now, that's about comparative statics. But the next thing is any demand function we think of, in principle, you can write the elasticity as a function of sales and you can write the convexity as a function of sales. And either they're very simple, in which case you can't invert the elasticity if it's constant. But if it's not constant, then you can, and if the, sorry, if convexity is not constant, you can, uh, you can invert these, okay? And uh, you get a function which relates the two. And I'm going to call that the demand manifold. It's not necessarily a function because it can curve in surprising ways, although the original demand function is nicely behaved, so locally it's a function. Okay? Uh, 
We've already seen some special cases. The CES case, it collapses to a point. That's the only case of which that's true. The linear case, it collapses to a line. And the Cobb-Douglas case, it collapses to that particular point. So we've, we know some demand manifolds already. Of course, in very general cases, you might expect that the demand manifold would depend on lots of other things. It would depend on shocks. A shock to the demand function, in principle, might shift the elasticity and might change the, uh, the convexity, and so might shift the, 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 uh, the manifold. So, in fact, in practice, we're going to be interested in manifolds that are invariant, manifolds that don't get shifted. And luckily, many demand functions, though they're very complicated in themselves, have invariant manifolds. Okay? Here's a family, which I'll talk about. It's the Pollack demand family. I won't go into the histori historical details. If, if gamma is zero, it's basically the CES. Okay? But with gamma in there, it includes a wide range of functions, this one is sometimes called a constant absolute risk aversion. Oh, by the way, sorry, before I give you some, we can solve the algebra is straightforward. Um, the elasticity now depends on theta. Okay. That was true in the CES case, but now it's true in a, in, a, in a more general way because we have lots of different values. Uh, here's my half Irish demand function, the CES there. The, the, the linear expenditure system, rather, the LES, coincides with Cobb-Douglas and so on. Uh, we have a whole range of demand functions. What I'm saying is this very simple family gives a range of behavior which is very different from the, from the CES family. Okay? Now, why does this matter? So far, I haven't really said anything about trade in this technical bit. So I'm going to jump a bit. I'm going to skip the technicalities and give you a single result on trade. And it fits into this, uh, this picture. Okay? Let's take an old Krugman model, the one I mentioned before, Monopolistic competition in international trade. Very simple model. There's no Hexerolene story here. There's simply in each country a single industry. Okay? And that industry is broken down into many different firms producing monopolistically competitively. Let's assume, see, uh, Krugman, as I said, focused a lot of the time on CES preferences. Let's assume Pollack preferences of the kind I gave you. And let's ask a Krugman question. What happens with globalization? Let K be the number of countries, and think of it as continuous for simplicity. So think of Vietnam, uh, Myanmar, formerly Burma, perhaps Burma again, joining the world. Uh, imagine that these countries are basically the same. That's the story. It's a simple model. Uh, what happens to, the, to welfare? Well, one nice feature is that in this simple framework, the uh, change in welfare depends only on our two parameters, the elasticity and the convexity. In the CES case, it takes a very simple form, okay? but in general, it may not even be, 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 be positive. Okay? And here's the boundary. Welfare is always positive along the CES locus, but it can fall in this extreme superconvex convex region. Okay? Now, is that interesting? Well, it's useful for teaching. This is not something that even the, the opponents of globalization, I think, would be encouraged to take up. It's not a strong argument against globalization because these are rather, they're not weird demand functions, but they're not common demand functions. So what happens for common demand functions? Well, here's the point of this whole section. For common demand functions, it turns out that welfare can actually increase by far more. Welfare rises by more, the lower is the convexity. So as we move away from CES, we're getting large incre larger increases in welfare as a result of an increase in globalization. Okay. So that's the end of this subsection. I couldn't resist talking about some very recent unpublished, indeed unwritten research. But what this is doing is taking the theory of monopolistic competition at face value and saying, accept that theory, but deviate from CES. And what do you find? It turns out that the results are not at all robust. You can get a fall in welfare. More likely, for reasonable parameter values, you're going to get a much larger in, uh, increase in welfare relative to the CES benchmark, which is just, in, in this case, is just a quarter, one third, one half, and so on. Now, I've been taking monopolistic competition at face value, and in the, I think it's um, perhaps 15 minutes left to me, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, or maybe, maybe even, I'm not sure. I will hope for 15 minutes left. In, in the remainder of the time, I want to talk about alternatives to monopolistic competition and why they might matter. Let's first try and think about monopolistic competition versus oligopoly. Okay. 
Monopolistic competition is where there are many, many firms, and they're all basically small. We'll come back to that. Oligopoly, competition among the few, is, I think, I'm going to argue, much more plausible, at least at the top end, for most, of, most markets, most world markets. Okay? And there's a paradox here, because in a way, the, the new trade theory, which built on heterolene but introduced product differentiation and so on, it borrowed from industrial organization, but only half of industrial organization. The theory of industrial organization uh, looks at both monopolistic competition and oligopoly. Actually, it, it devotes far more attention to oligopoly than to, than, than to monopolistic competition. However, it's typically cast in partial equilibrium only. Okay? The classic textbook uh, in French as well as in, in English as well as in French on industrial organization by Jean Tirole at, at the University of, of Toulouse uh, has one entry in the index, it's a big 400 page book, one entry in the index for general equilibrium. Okay? Well, that, that reflects the field. People who work in partial equilibrium typically ignore, uh, sorry, people who work in industrial organization typically focus on individual industries rather than on the economy as a whole. In trade, we're interested in the economy as a whole, but the theory of oligopoly got squeezed out by monopolistic competition, and I'll, I'll talk about some of the reasons shortly. Now, it's not that monopolistic competition is, is, is a bad thing. It's a big improvement over perfect competition if you want to explain north-north trade, as, as Roger pointed out in his talk. Uh, if you're interested in um, goods that are um, differentiated, then you can't use a perfectly competitive model. And monopolistic competition does allow for increasing returns, sometimes modelled in very simple ways, but that's fine. It's a big advance over perfect competition. And that advance is what has allowed monopolistic competition to make many contributions over the last 20, 30 years, uh, explaining industry trade, the first and, and most, uh, uh, most striking, perhaps, but uh, moving on to explaining, to some extent, multinational corporations, economic geography, agglomeration, and so on. But that's only part of the story. Uh, monopolistic competition is, is more plausible than perfect competition, but actually not much. It, it retains two of the less attractive features of perfect competition. It continues to assume that firms are tiny. Infinitesimal, strictly, if you write down an integral, as I did, a continuum of firms, each one of measure zero, mathematically, each one tiny, okay? tiny relative to the industry, not just to the economy as a whole. And, more, uh, and, and in addition to that, firms don't behave strategically in any way. They don't try and guess what each other are doing. There's none of the stuff that you read about in uh, business school manuals or in popular books about rivalry between Pepsi and, and Coke or rivalry between, between, between different large companies and so on. There's none, none, of, uh, none of that stuff is allowed in the theory at all. It is allowed in industrial organization, in the theory of oligopoly. Okay, so why did that not come into trade? Well, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, about that under a number of different headings. One is, first of all, the issue of free entry. Okay? And standard trade models basically assume that entry is instantaneous. That's true in perfect competition, but it's also true in monopolistic competition. Okay? Now, if you look at the real world, the evidence here suggests that entry and exit are not so important in the short run. So if you're interested in explaining behavior, even of small firms in the short run, then assuming entry and exit, the way we put it is assuming that firms adjust along the extensive margin, that is to say, firms closing down or new firms entering. That margin of adjustment is extremely unimportant in the short run. A recent paper, uh, Léonard Fontanier from Paris and colleagues in the Journal of International Economics, shows that French firms in the recent crisis adjusted along the intensive margin. They didn't close down, they produced less. The markets that were, that were doing badly, they exported less to those markets. Okay? Uh, there was, they didn't exit markets. It's not just the firms themselves didn't close down, they didn't, they didn't lose their presence in a particular foreign market. They just reduced the amount they were selling. Evidence for US firms confirms this, that uh, the extensive margin, the one highlighted by the theory of monopolistic competition, like the theory of perfect competition, is more important over the longer time horizon, much less important over a period of trivially unimportant over one year, much less important over five years. So that's the first point. Second is that entry and exit are much less important for large firms. 
For technical reasons, Mark Mellots, in his, in his classic paper, had to assume that uh, the probability of any firm dying, that is to say exiting, was a constant. But in particular, well, that, that's fair enough, perhaps for a firm, you have to make assumptions to build models. But he assumed that, uh, more strongly, that that probability was independent of the size of the firm, or the size is endogenous, independent of its productivity, its underlying productivity. In the real world, would we expect that? Which is more likely to close down tomorrow morning? Okay? A corner store or, um, uh, or a huge supermarket chain? Okay? A tiny firm supplying components to the auto industry or Renault? Which, is, which would you predict is more likely to close down? Well, the evidence makes it very clear that your instinct is right. Large firms are persistent. Okay? Very successful firms are typically older, and older firms are less likely to exit than younger ones. Finally, uh, entry and exit, as we've seen already, the very beginning I talked about the, uh, the fact that the big firms account for most of the value of exports. Well, again, uh, if you count numbers of firms, you will find lots of exiters and lots of entrants. But if you count exporters, if you focus, uh, or rather, not exporters, but the value of exports, if you look at that, then in fact, there is much less entry and exit. Okay. So the picture we get confirm from the data, confirms uh, what I'm suggesting, uh, an emerging picture here, whereby the assumption of instantaneous entry and exit much less plausible in the, um, uh, uh, in the real world than it is in the, uh, uh, in the models typically used in trade. Now, it's interesting, even if entry is completely free, it's still possible to have a situation where the equilibrium number of firms is, is given or at least does not, ex it does not grow uh, uh, without bound. This is sometimes called, uh, after Shackett and Sutton, a case of natural oligopoly. I think it can be traced to at least Das Gupta and Stiglitz, Gavsvich and Thies. And natural oligopoly may come about if firms, in response to an increase in market size, don't just sit there and allow more competitors to enter, but they make investments. They may invest in marketing to, increase, to, to try and maintain their market share, or they may invest in uh, process innovation in order to try and improve the, uh, 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 their productivity, to bring down their costs. If firms engage in that form of behaviour, then there may in fact be a, a natural number of large firms in response to an increase in market size, and think of that as globalisation. Go back to Dixit Stiglitz preferences, the ones that I, as I, uh, that I mentioned, which, rely, uh, which underlie most of modern uh, international trade theory. With Dixit Stiglitz preferences, if the market doubles in size, the number of firms, home, if they're all the same size, will double in size. In the, mar in the Mellots extension, firms are heterogeneous, but still a doubling of uh, the market size will give rise to a doubling of the mass of firms. In Cournot competition, it's slightly less, this is a standard, um, uh, um, standard uh, model of, 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 uh, of, of, of duopoly. Um, I, uh, I, I have to digress, I'm afraid. I have to tell you my story about Augustine Cournot, who was, uh, I'm afraid, one of life's great losers. He wrote this amazing book in 1830. And if you go back and look at it, it looks kind of familiar. It looks rather like an intermediate microeconomic textbook. Uh, he has all the diagrams. He has concepts there, very different names and terminology. But it's really incredibly modern. Uh, and sadly, he was far ahead of his time. Uh, so much so that, to the best of my knowledge, he didn't get a single book review uh, in, in, while he was alive. Okay? And it gets worse. The first significant book review that he did get, he was, I forget where he was based, but uh, uh, a professor of, I think, engineering in, uh, in Ecole Polytechnique, called Bertrand, wrote a review after poor old Cournot had died, and in his review he said, Cournot is rubbish. Okay? Cournot had said that if you've two firms, then you won't get anything like perfect competition, because they will be rivals to each other, and they will choose a very different pattern of production than a perfectly competitive industry would. And Bertrand said, that's silly for two reasons. It's silly because firms don't choose their quantities, they choose their prices. And it's hard to argue with that, actually. So the Bertrand model continues, and indeed the debate between Cournot and Bertrand 
which even began after Cor poor old Cournot had died, uh, that debate continues to, uh, uh, to motivate us today. And Bertrand's second point was, now, if you take the Cournot model and firms set prices, well, what price are they going to set? They're playing what we would now call a Nash equilibrium, all this long before Nash. Okay? And one firm will set it one price, the other firm will choose a little lower. And then the next firm will respond and choose a little lower. Exactly how the timing is working out is, of this happens is something that modern theorists have worried about. But we all agree that at the, the bottom line story is if the two firms have the same cost, they will both end up pricing at marginal cost. And what do we call price equal to marginal cost? We call it perfect competition. So Bertrand's riposte to the dead Cournot was that the new model is, is a loser on two counts. We still use it, though, and I much prefer it to the Bertrand model. And uh, I think it gives interesting results here. So end of digression, end of colourful digression, with apologies. The um, Cournot model predicts, rather than uh, a straight line for CES, it predicts this kind of curved relationship. Here, to be fair, I am taking the number of firms as, 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 as a real variable, and that actually doesn't make so much sense. But when you adjust this to allow for integer n, okay, number of firms measured in firms, one firm, two firms, three firms, the story is pretty much the same. Okay? We do find, though, that as globalization continues, the number of firms increases. So this is not as extreme as monopolistic competition, but it nonetheless does predict something quite different from what we see in the data. It predicts that uh, as uh, globalization proceeds, we will, this, this, although it doesn't go to infinity as rapidly as, um, as the uh, CES case, uh, there are difficult, difficult issues in taking these limits, which I won't delay on here, but uh, it does actually converge to perfect competition. But that's without what I mentioned a moment ago, without the natural oligopoly idea. These firms in these pictures are not responding to the market size, except, of course, there are more, there's a bigger market, so they would try to expand and increase their output, but there will be more firms entering. We're assuming here completely free entry, not in the spirit of Kurno at all, not really in the spirit of oligopoly at all. Oops. And finally, I've, I've, I'm sorry, I missed my cue there. What happens if we have um, natural oligopoly? That is to say, if firms respond by investing, in order to improve their productivity, when the market gets bigger, they have a bigger incentive to invest. And so what we get here, ETA, is a measure of how effective investment is. In fact, if you look at this curve with ETA zero, it's basically the same one as in the previous diagram. So that's the, the pure Cournot case. But now the impure or amended Cournot case, where firms can invest to bring down their costs, we find actually that the number of firms is not going to increase beyond bound. Globalization will not eliminate the Renaults and the Carrefours and, uh, and the General Motors of this world. In fact, even in declining industries, General Motors continues, perhaps with government help, and in industry and, and in many other industries, the leaders 20 or 40 years ago are still the leaders today. Again, with integer n, the story is a little more complicated, converging in this example to a natural monopoly, although quite slowly and plausibly slowly for, uh, for an intermediate level of uh, the effectiveness of investment. So that's what I want to say about free entry. I will come back to talk a little bit about entry in, 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 uh, at, a, at a later stage, but uh, simply to note that there are many reasons why the assumption of free entry in monopolistically competition, in, in models that have monopolistic competition, that assumption is not a good one. But even if you accepted that assumption, there are still other ways of ad ad adapting the model which would lead to something very different from monopolistic competition. But let me move on to one of the strong points of the new trade theory. The new trade theory that I mentioned, remember that lambda? That lambda gives a nice link between partial and general equilibrium. And that's been one of the great strengths of the, uh, the Dixit-Stiglitz approach and one of the reasons why the approach of Krugman and Mellet has dominated the models so far. And I, here I think I can refer to, uh, to Roger Gainery's presentation. Uh, I, I, if you've sat through a number of lectures now, you will appreciate, unlike industrial organisation, the, the questions that we're really interested in in trade are mostly general equilibrium. Of course, it's interesting to know how will a particular industry do uh, as a result of uh, globalization. 
Uh, it's interesting to ask about particular labour markets, skilled versus unskilled, that sort of thing. But in fact, if you want to understand those things, you're typically going to need a general equilibrium model. And what do I mean by general equilibrium here? This doesn't necessarily mean a full-fledged arrow de Bru model, but it must at least be a model that allows some degree of interactions between goods and factor markets. So it can't just focus on a single market the way the theory of industrial organisation does, and, and, and quite usefully because of the questions it's interested in. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that in the past it has been thought that there were barriers to putting, to doing what I call putting oligopoly into general equilibrium. So you put OL into GE and you get goal, which is a misspelling, of course, of the English word goal or objective. It's been an objective of theorists for many years, and it's one that hasn't really been realized yet. Typically, the arguments that people, that economists have worried about, theorists have worried about, is, well, if firms are large, won't they be able to affect wages as well? Maybe they'll affect national income. Maybe they'll affect the price level. I don't believe real firms do any of these things very much. Maybe wages in local labour markets. But even uh, Microsoft doesn't delay the date of introducing a new operating system in order to influence national income. It tries to forecast national income, of course, but it doesn't try to influence national income. Even Microsoft or General Motors is not that big in the US economy. Okay? So I think the resolution to this is a simple one. It was pointed out by Oliver Hart, uh, and others have worked on it many years ago. It hasn't really been taken up. I argued for this a few years ago. And the simple idea is to view firms as what I call large in the small, but small in the large. They're large in their own market, but their own market is small. Okay? And because they're in a, their individual market is small, they are small in the economy as a whole. So we can allow them to take wages, national income, and the price level is given. In fact, it turns out to be easy to do that in terms of lambda. Just like monopolistic competition, lots of different sectors, each sector is small. The difference is there are more firms, more than one firm in each sector. Okay? So we get the same kind of setup with lambda in there, once again, summarizing the, the stuff that's going on outside the economy, outside the industry. Okay? With firms inside the industry, their perceived demand function, taking lambda as given. Well, this is an approach I've, I've argued for in lots of different contexts. Let me just give you one application of this. I'll just mention this. It's to the, uh, the case of cross-border mergers. Foreign direct investment, a really important phenomenon in the modern world. But in fact, economists have a pretty good understanding of what we like to call the greenfield type of foreign direct investment. So a big French firm sets up uh, uh, a subsidiary on a green field, buys a green field, builds a new factory uh, in, uh, in a poor, poorer country, you know, or, or perhaps in the US, in order to serve the US market. We have a pretty good understanding of that kind of foreign direct investment. We understand cross-border mergers much less well. And it turns out the big ones are the cross-border mergers. The green field type is, is much less important quantitatively. Well, in my own work, I've used this framework to note the following. If you think about it, mergers can be for different reasons. They can be purely strategic. Nasty firms, if you like, buying out a rival in order essentially to close it down, or at least to merge the two facilities in order to drive up prices and exploit consumers. Alternatively, as firms, of course, usually claim, they can be for, for synergies. Okay? One firm says, if I buy the other firm, we're complementary, and together we'll be better than apart. Okay? So it's not about exploiting consumers. In fact, it's going to be good for consumers. It's going to bring down costs, and that's going to be good for everyone. Well, in partial equilibrium, in a single industry, these strategic mergers are bad news, of course, because they raise prices, and that's bad for consumers. But in general equilibrium, you have to ask, raising prices relative to what? Well, they raise prices relative to wages. But wages may be changing. And these even nasty, selfishly motivated strategic mergers can actually raise welfare if they take the form of bigger firms, efficient firms, buying out smaller firms. And as a result, resources, factors of production, being reallocated to more efficient firms. I'm not saying that's the only explanation or the only aspect of mergers that one can think of, but I think that is an important perspective that comes from, from looking in a, a, in a model of oligopoly with general equilibrium. I'm almost out of time and almost out of 
topics. So if I might briefly end by talking about superstar firms. I've argued from the beginning that the evidence suggests that large firms are different, and it's not just that they're larger. It's a qualitative difference. Okay? They do more things, that they're, they're more complicated, and so on. And when you look at the data, as I said before, it's bimodal. Very large firms and very small firms, and actually surprisingly little in between. Well, that suggests a way of modeling this, which is to think of an oligopoly with multi-product firms, a small number of firms, perhaps without much exit or entry, without any, plus a fringe of tiny firms, a continuum, many, many firms, all monopolistically competitive. It's easy to say that, it's hard to model it, but there is one technical virtue in this. If we think of the large firms as producing a finite measure of goods, then technically the large firms really are large. The products are all of measure zero, all tiny, they're all equally differentiated. And it turns out there are models, including one of my own, uh, a recent model which has done this kind of thing for multi-product firms in trade. In that paper, we did not actually look at uh, the coexistence of these multi-product firms and smaller ones, but it's easy to think about extending it in that direction. And there is some progress in this. Uh, Matthew Parenti, recent graduate from Paris 1, and Jacques Thys at, uh, at Cor and Louvain, uh, Louvain -le Neuve, have worked on what Parenti calls the David and Goliath model, which I proposed in, a, in, a, in an earlier paper, where you've large firms and small firms, and you worry about the interaction between them. I, I think that's a promising mode of research. I think it's going to turn up interesting ideas, which may challenge some of the current orthodoxies in monopolistic competition. To conclude, uh, what's the best model? We don't, we're not at the stage of physics where we're looking for a single model to explain everything. Uh, I don't think we should aim for that. We should have lots of different models, and they should be plausible and falsifiable, and as Einstein might have said, almost said, they should be simple, but not too much so. They should be as simple as necessary, and no simpler. Okay? They should use as little mathematics as necessary, but no, but no less than that. Uh, and what should... Uh, what would be desirable? Well, I've argued that they should not rely too much on special functional forms, that at least if you want to explain aggregate behaviour in established industries, you want to recognise large firms and recognise that they behave strategically. You do want to allow for general equilibrium, allow different sectors to, to, to interact, and you certainly want to think about free entry, although probably only necessary to think about that by small firms, uh, uh, at least from a modelling point of view. M most important of all, we do need to allow for superstar firms. They're there in the data, they're there in the real world, they're all around us. When somebody says to me, do you really think we need to worry about oligopoly in international trade? I ask them, what brand of toothpaste did you use this morning? There are only three big toothpaste manufacturers in the world. There are lots of them, and developing countries have their own little brands and so on, but most of the, most of the world, there, 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 there are three, maybe four big players. Uh, and that's true of many other industries, not just consumer good industries. So I leave you with that. Thank you for your comments, and I'm happy to discuss further. Thanks.